All right, so we're going to continue looking at centripetal motion, uniform circular motion. And we're going to take a look at something that people probably know a little bit better. A Ferris wheel. Okay, so if you get on a Ferris wheel, it will actually make you move around in a circle because it spins around and then there's happiness and joy. Unless you're afraid of heights. Then there's sheer terror and screaming. Both, both are memorable, memorable situations. But let's take a look at, because if something's fun, we should make it even more fun by understanding all the science that governs it. Yay! So what we're going to do is I'm going to say that the radius of this uh, Ferris wheel, so the radius here, r equals 10 meters. So that guy's about 60 feet tall or so if you're at the very top of it. Okay, decent sized Ferris wheel. And I'm going to say that this guy is moving pretty quickly. We're going to have it do one complete revolution. It's all the way around in one minute. Hopefully I'm not cutting that off at the top. How we refer to that is big T, that's called period. And that is basically the time it takes to do one complete cycle, one complete circle. Okay. In this case, one cycle is one circle. In the future, we may talk about things that have repeating cycles, but they're not necessarily circles. They just do something and come back to where they started. Okay. But in this case, we're dealing with a circle, so the time it takes to go all the way around that circle is t equals 1 minute, which is 60 seconds. Alright, so that's how long it takes for people when they hop in on the bottom to go all the way around and come back on. So I guess that's one where they're not stopping it to load people on and off. Maybe it's some sort of uh, death rally type one where you have to jump on the cars. I do not envy the insurance premiums on that one. All right. What I want to do is I want to find out it's a truly strange thing. So you've got people going in a circle here, and as we saw with the previous video and what we're talking about, when you apply Newton's first law, things in general, people included, don't like going in circles. They want to go in straight lines. Newton's first law says that an object will continue moving in a straight line unless acted upon by a force. Okay, so for this to, for anyone riding in the Ferris wheel to be moving in a circle, well, if something's moving in a circle, moving in a circle, it must have a force, and more specifically, a centripetal force. Some force that's pushing the thing, whatever it happens to be, in a circle. I'm going to look at a situation right here at the bottom. Okay? So I'm going to draw a free body diagram of me on the Ferris wheel at the very bottom. I've got force of gravity. I've got a normal force holding me up. And I may have a force of friction keeping me from sliding around in the car itself, but that doesn't really matter too much in this case. Because right now, at this specific point, my centripetal force, it's got to be something that's pointed towards the center. Remember we said that centripetal is center-seeking. It's going to try and find, always point towards the center of our circle. So, in this case, it's got to point straight up. Well, odds are good that our normal force is our centripetal force. But, this is going to be a little weird, only part of our normal force is that. In fact, when you're in a Ferris wheel like this, if you have a scale and you were to take a measurement of how much you weighed as you go up and down, when you get to the bottom, you'll actually weigh a little bit more. And when you're at the top, and we could take a look at that too, that may be something that you want to take a look at on your own, do what we're about to do except at the top and see what you come up with, you'll actually find that you weigh a little bit less. So. Best diet plan is to get on a Ferris wheel that's going really, really fast and only look at the scale when you're at the top. But we'll see that here in just a moment. So what I want to know is, I want to find out what my normal force is when I'm at the bottom of this Ferris wheel. Okay. 
Well, if I do my sum of forces, because I have my free body diagram, I'm going to do my sum of forces in the y direction, the way that this is set up. Seems to go pretty well with the y. I'm going to say that that is equal to my normal force minus mg, and that's going to be equal to my mass times my acceleration in the y. Okay, well that looks pretty familiar, except what's different from what we've done in the past is our acceleration in the y is not equal to zero. In this case, we've got an acceleration that we experience in the y at this exact moment at the bottom of the Ferris wheel ride. It's pointed straight up towards the center of the circle, and it's an acceleration that's making us go in a circle. Well, we talked about that. That's our centripetal acceleration. We know that that goes along with v squared over r. That's our equation for it. All right. All right. So our acceleration is not equal to zero. In fact, there doesn't appear to be any zeros in this. We know that there's a normal force. We know that I have a mass. There's gravity, acceleration of gravity here. And then I have a mass. And now we've established that my acceleration in the y direction is not equal to zero. None of these things are equal to zero. But I still want to find my normal force. OK, well, if I say that I have a mass of, what was I going with on this one? Where's my stuff? Mass. Mass equals 60 kilograms. OK, so that's about 140 pounds, maybe 150, just off the top of my head. Okay, so 60 kilograms is the mass of the person riding on this Ferris wheel. And so now we've got a mass. We know the acceleration due to gravity. Got a mass. Don't know my acceleration in the y. I do know that it's equal to my centripetal acceleration, so I'm going to do that as mass times my centripetal acceleration. So I know this. I know this. I know this. If I can find this guy, then I can solve for my normal force. All right, well, I know that that's equal to v squared over r, so if I take this, I'm going to have, um, I'll do it below here. So I've got normal force minus mg equals mass times, my centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. All right, do I know my velocity? No. I know my r, right? It's 10 meters. Okay, so that's one more thing. Now I need my velocity. Well, is there a way that I can find out how fast I'm going? I know how long it takes me to go all the way around this Ferris wheel. If I knew how, what the distance of that, that I'm actually going, then I could find out my velocity. So velocity equals distance over time. In this case, my time is 60 seconds to go all the way around it. My distance, well, if I'm going in a circle, the distance is going to be my circumference, right? And that's going to be equal to 2 pi r over my time, which is capital T for my period. Well, that's my velocity. All right. So if I plug that in, I end up with normal force minus mass times gravity equals mass times v squared, which is going to be 2 pi r over t squared over r. Okay, I simplify this guy up a little bit. I'm going to do that over here. Normal force minus gravity equals, I'm going to square that out. So I'll have mass divided by r. I'll just put that over here and then I'll evaluate this squared times 2 squared is 4. Pi squared is pi squared. r squared over t squared. And this r is going to cancel out with that r. I'm going to get this simplified down a little bit more. I can do my normal force minus mg equals 4m pi squared r over t. I'm going to add my mg to both sides. And I end up with my normal force equals 4 times my mass times pi squared times r over t squared. I'm sorry, I dropped that squared because the t is inside this, this thing that gets squared to, plus mg. Now if I plug in all of my values, 4, that's 4, m is 60 kilograms, pi, well that's pi, I'm going to square that, r is 10 meters, t squared is going to be 60 seconds squared, which will be 
3600 seconds squared, plus mass 60 times g, 9.81, I'm going to end up with my normal force. What the scale would read if I were standing on one, let me see if I've got this, is going to be, um, where did I write that down? Oh, yeah, there. Yep. 595.2 newtons. All right, and if I evaluate mg, what my, what my weight would normally be, I find that that is actually equal to 588.6. I find that this extra term from me going in a circle, what's forcing me in the circle, I actually, I gain about one pound from going around this Ferris wheel. At the top, because of symmetry, if I look at the very top, I'll actually lose a pound. Now, if I were to change this, where my period was actually equal to 30 seconds, I'm going to speed it up by a factor of 2. I don't recommend any Ferris wheel operators try this. Um, it's not a race. It's all about the view. But if I do that, I will find that instead, I gain about 6 pounds. And if I keep going faster and faster, because there's a squared term in here, we're actually going to find that the more you speed it up, you're going to gain quite a bit more. Okay? It's not that you're actually more massive, it's just that you're pressing down harder on the scale. That's what a scale actually reads. It'll tell you what the normal force is. If you're standing still and, not a, and your house isn't accelerating or whatever you've got the scale on, then normally, as we've seen before, the normal force will be equal and opposite to your mass times gravity, and it can be a representation, a direct way of trying to find out what your mass is. In this case, because we're actually moving, at the bottom and at the top, we'll find that the scale will read something more. Because we're, we're not actually being pushed into the bottom of the Ferris wheel anymore. It's just the Ferris wheel is trying to move upwards, so it's pushing us up. So the normal force goes up so that it, it can push us into the circle. Just the same way as the car door pushes us around a turn when we're on the road.